Thank you very much. So, hello everyone. So I will just talk about solar irradiance and also planetary upper atmosphere, the connection between those two. Uh, but first, I will actually concentrate myself on the solar irradiance part. So, okay, it works. So here, so that's something you are, you are already seen if you are familiar with this type of seminar. But it's just to remind to remind you a bit. So here we got the solar spectrum which is solar irradiance. So first approximation of the back body at uh, 5,777 Kelvin. But since the sun has an atmosphere, so you have here a bunch of uh, emission line, which are actually very important for the upper part of the atmosphere. And yet this on part of the EUV part only represents 1% of the total solar irradiance, so the total energy integrates all over the, the solar spectrum. So this part is very, a very important link for the between planets, upper atmospheric part, and that's why we, as we shall see at the end, with the planetary space weather. For here, we have two interesting parts of the solar spectrum. As you have an emission part, which is below uh, roughly 200 nanometers, and also an ab absorption spectrum part, which will be above 200 nanometers, so we will see why. And so the main question here for the next probably 20 minutes is how do we model the solar spectral irradiance? So, and, and for the last 15 minutes, I will explain why it's important to model it. So just a back of history, so it's already been shown in the previous uh, web uh, seminar, but just, so you start with the Rayleigh genes law, which uh, was a very good approximation at first, especially for the visible part. But then if you go down to very low wavelengths and you have this ultraviolet problem because then the irradiance will tend to the infinity, to the infinite, so that was a real problem. Then you have the black body, so the uh, uh, low Planck law, which is actually correct all the problem, which is actually perfect for the sun at the first order. But then this, this law cannot explain some observation has been made on Earth, especially some uh, some band of the ionized nitrogen, which has been uh, discussed in 1937. And actually, if you want to explain those ionized, part, uh, ionized uh, nitrogen, you have to at least one million uh, UV photons are missing uh, if you just take into account this Planck law. So it doesn't work. So what do we do? So the thing which has been already very well discussed by, uh, by Matt, Matt West last time, that you have the solar corona, okay? So the, that's upper solar atmosphere. And this upper part of the atmosphere is much more hotter, meaning much more energetic. It's not real temperature. It's more hotter, but it's also more energetic than the photosphere. So it's extremely, extremely energetic, 10 million Kelvin, 1 million Kelvin, but most importantly, it's very poorly dense. And it's also compounds, composed only by ionized and excited elements. So how do we go from this statement to go to the emission processes? So we have some um, ions. Then I'm not, I'm not only talking about uh, ions right now, just not, uh, excited, uh, only excited uh, particles, not ions so far. But yes, we just have to take into account an ion, which will be excited. So if you have some collision with the electrons in the, in, the, in the corona. In that case, you will have some inelastic collision, meaning that you are actually some lost or gain of kinetic energy. So if you have an electron with an energy E1, for example, this energy, this electron will give some energy to the ion, then you will go from the exit, said from E to G in that case, so it's excitation, and also you have the counterpart with the excitation. And what is important here is to try to have an estimation of the red coefficient of this reaction. So how do we do that? So we have to first into, take into account the electron population will be really the velocity interval between V and V plus dV. And also taking into account the electron density and also how this uh, the electron density velocity distribution in that case. And then we usually use the, the Maxwell-Boltzmann distribution in that case. And so we will have actually an estimate of the total number of collision for a transition between the level G to E. Well, also you can do the other way around, but which actually will end, make intervene the, uh, the 
Uh -huh. Great. Okay, so we make the, the electron density, also the, uh, the the distribution of the velocity of the electrons, and also one parameter very important would be the cross section. Okay. So with this, we have an estimate of the total number of collision. We'll get will make the ion more excited, or more in low level energy. And if we divide by the uh, electron density, we actually will have the reaction coefficient, as we call it, and then just for the, the excitation by collision, we could have exactly the same ID if we have the, in that case, there will be C E to G, and that would be the excitation coefficient. And what is very important here, as I said, it's the cross-section here. So that cross-section will actually be only depending on the considered ions for a certain type of energy in that case. Okay, but we also have to consider another loss reaction. You can also de-excite the ion, the ion just also by the radioactive decay, meaning the emission. So just if to consider with the Einstein coefficient for this particular uh, state of the ions, we will have some uh, loss of uh, energy just by emitting radiation. So what do we do now? We just do what um, we just use to consider everything we just said, and then we consider the equilibrium state. So we have two types of processes. We have the, the excitation process, the collision by electron, and the de-excitation process, which also be by the collision by electron, but also by with radiation, the radiative decay. And now, I just that's really to show an example. So it's really, really simple stuff. So it, I just consider only two levels of the ground and one excited level, which is very, which is very oversimplified. Of course, you have to take into account all the level of uh, of energy of the specified ions, of course. But then it's just for you to, to show. So here we have just um, this, this principle uh, detail equilibrium. So in, then you have the, the excitation phase, and then you have the excitation phase. So you go from the ground to the level E and uh, I, and then you go to the level I to G, to the ground. But since we are in the corona, then it's very interesting to see that there is a very low density, which I actually could go to simplify again this, uh, this, uh, this equation and just going back to that, uh, something that people already said in the seminar before, that everything is proportional to the electron density at the end. Since we have the electron density, you have the number of ions in the ground state, you have the, co the rate coefficient, and you have the number of ions in the, this excited state, and also the, now the the NJ coefficient for the relative decay. Okay, so can we go a little bit further? Okay, just this, this demonstration is only correct for the corona, of course, because you have made this assumption that you said that there is a very low density which actually can simplify this equation. Now, if you go for the photosphere and the chromosphere, the density is not is more important. So you have to take into a, you have to take in. Uh, the relative uh, transfer into account in that case. Because in that case, you will actually try to excitate also by just uh, absorbing some emissions. And then you will have now the, uh, the, this equation will be a little bit more complex, and then you will have one additional term over here. But that, in that case, we will go in the, the part when you have the absorption part of the solar spectrum, so roughly above 200 nanometers. So hopefully for us, we are only considering the corona for the upper planetary atmosphere, that emission coming from the corona. So what about the ionized element? It's exactly the same approach, okay? So you just have to make uh, uh, the equilibrium between different um, uh, ion, uh, ionized elements, but that's exactly the same approach. So the more energy you will have, the more ionized uh, particular, so that's for the oxygen, so that's uh, oxygen 2, 3, 4, and so according to the temperature, also for the iron, etc. So, sorry, it's in French, but... Okay, so, so there is a general rule which has already been very well explained before, so the more temperature, higher the temperature is, the density are higher enough, then you will have the more the higher level state, uh, state will be occupied. If I go for a temperature of uh, 5.8 in the logarithm scale, then it means that the iron 10 were actually the most probable excitation state, and that will lead to the emission at 17.1 nanometers. So here's a very beautiful pictures, and then one could say that as a remainder, as a remainder observation on one particular wavelength will give you structural information for one particular altitude, knowing that there is one particular temperature for this particular altitude. 
Um, okay, so now how do we do for estimate erosion from this? So we will actually try to find a way to, Im to estimate the emitted power through the relative decay within an opti optically thin medium. In that case, we just have to use this equation that the power will actually be the, the number of ion or excitant ion or ionous ion in this particular state multiplied by the Einstein coefficient and the difference in, of energy between those two states. And then the ions will actually be the, will actually be integrated over the line of sight uh, on the top of the solar atmosphere. As soon as you, the emission goes away from the corona, then actually the solar, the solar radiance will actually can be measured from Earth, for example, and that will give the same number. Um, but if you yeah, of course, when we go for this, we always try to come back to something we know and then to have an estimation of the number of, uh, of ions in this particular state. We can actually try to see a bit further and then we can actually de decompose this and then try to see. Uh, okay, so at the end, we can divide by the number of ions in the ground state. That's also considering the number of ion in the ground state, but also not ionized. So in that case, those are directly given by uh, me uh, quantum mechanics. This also is giving by the number F element co uh, compared to the number of hydrogen, which is called the abundance. That's only that depending on the model uh, of the star I am using for the sun, for example. That's also particularly a key parameter for the absolute spectrum, so above 200 nanometers. And actually here you have also have the number of um, the ratio between the hydrogen over electron, and that's directly something we know by measurement, or that's supposed to be 0 0.83, and then at the end, the number density. So <clears throat> that's just a way to come back to something we know, something that has been measured. And if we combine the two at the end, we'll end up with, uh, we can define a, a, rep a, a repetition function and at the end, and you come back to the exactly the same idea as the irradiance that will be integrated over the line of sight. But this parameter here actually includes all the physics of the transition, so all the elements you want to know, which is given so by the, the quantum mechanics, but also by the type of stars, the sun. And now about the physical parameter of the medium, so exactly the electric density where we are in the, in the solar corona. So at the end, everything is go back to simple, and I am almost done for this part. So since also we can try to also to simplify this, yes, it's, it's possible, then just by taking into account that the electronic density will actually evolve in the altitude, and also to then also accordingly to the temperature. And then you can introduce what we call the differential emission measurement, which actually be directly depending on the, the number of uh, the electric density along the line of sight according to the, the, according to the temperature differential. And, okay, and if you do that, you came up with, um, with this uh, um, equation that will give you actually the, the solar irradiance at the top of the solar atmosphere. So I'm coming back here, that's defin definitely the, 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 um, the signature of the part of the medium, so directly depending on the, the, dense, the electron density, and here is only the, uh, coming back to the quantum mechanic part, only to have an equilibrium, an equilibrium between the, the, level, the different um, populated level for one ion, specified ions. And what is very interesting for us now is that its structure, meaning a sunspot, meaning a, um, a facula or as the network, etc as his own uh, DM. So in theory, here you have a nice picture that you can see the, the DM for different uh, structure, for a coronal hole over there, for a quiet center, for an active region. So in, in, theory, in theory, if you come based on this, if you can retrieve uh, the, um, just by looking at some images, you can actually uh, attribute each structure coming back to the DM, and then actually you can find out the, the typical solar irradiance. Okay, in theory, this is not a very precise method because there is a lot of unknowns, especially because everything is not very clear about the uh, mechanic, uh, quantum mechanic which has been involved. But a lot of attempts have been made in the past, and then it was working quite good somehow, but still the empirical and semi-empirical models do a better work. 
to do a better job, which is uh, not surprising because it's semi-empirical approach or empirical approach, so it's, so it's, uh, it's somehow more easy, but I, I will, I'd like this idea to only use a physical, complete physical model in that case, but we need still some, some work on that. Okay, so now I didn't, I just, I was just talking about emission line, but I didn't talk about the continuum. So you have also the continuum, which is basically two processes, so the free free emission, the Bremsstrahlung, and also the free bond emissions. And then you will have some characteristic in the, in the solar spectrum because you, the photon energy cannot go down below the ionizing energy boundary for considering elements. Which means that in this picture, for example, you have some, so have some drop here if you take a, a, into account a particular element. So if you take the aluminum here, you have absorption for, for uh, uh, sorry, it's the other way around, but for a very, very uh, exa uh, high photon energy, and at some point, poof, you have nothing because the, the uh, photon is not energetic anymore to excite it. the aluminum. At least the, uh, the aluminum doesn't absorb the energy, so it's completely transported at some point. And here, what is very interesting that you, you, are come, you are going back to this um, difference between the absorption spectrum and the emission spectrum. And what is actually very important for the solar spectrum is that it's not just the hydrogen, but that's the H minus, so the, just the one proton actually. And then actually that's the most important part for the solar spectrum because it, it has the element with the most effective absorption. And we also have to take into account the molecule if you're going to go further, of course. But then actually that's a picture from Shapiro et al. Sorry, I missed the reference. But then it's, uh, the, the role of the molecule is more important for the solar spectrum for below 300, uh, above 300 nanometers. So it's for the UV part, as we are discussing here, it's not that uh, important. Okay, now, so now I'm coming back to the last part of my talk already, sorry. And then actually um, we try to make the link between the external forcing, which are between my case, solar UV irradiance, and the upper planetary atmosphere. So it's, here it's uh, again, it's um, fine, sorry. So it's, uh, it's just a cartoon to show you the, the different um, solar part of the solar spectrum. It could be interesting for for the for any kind of uh, planet, so it's for the Earth. But anyway, so you have the infrared part, which actually be uh, sorry, you have the UV extreme part will actually be responsible of the radiation of the ionosphere, also some kind of heating in the atmosphere. The UV part, which will be the ionization, especially for the ozone, and also the heating part. And the visible and infrared were more, especially the long wave radiation, which is actually more interesting for for climate purposes. So you have the impact of solar UV. Okay, so the solar UV flux will on, only uh, be actually uh, excited the, the, the upper, upper planetary part and actually will cause some day glow emission. So you have some atmospheric emission only coming from the solar UV excitation. And so you also have the counterpart, which actually be through electronic precipitation. This one you are probably more familiar because that's the typical aurora emission. So you have the picture of Ganymede, which you actually see is an uh, emission in the UV from the oxygen. Um, okay, so just a uh, quick summary. So you have the UV part. So the UV does control the ionosphere because as the UV will actually have enough energy to ionize the, the upper part of the atmosphere. Now for the full UV uh, from 1 to 300 nanometers, that, that, that will be actually control the whole chemistry and the dynamic of the atmosphere. No, ozone and um, the molecular oxygen. And for the far UV, uh, middle UV part, which actually would be the main source um, of the mesosphere and stratosphere. So here you have um, uh, a result of where you see where the energy is, deposit, is deposited within the atmosphere. And, um, but what is also interesting that the UV flux, so principally, from 200 to 350 nanometers will actually hit the thermosphere. And that's more in the space weather context that's also very interesting because then you will have some thermal expansion of the atmosphere. And then actually the neutral density can double at 400 kilometers, which is typically the low Earth orbit. And in that case, you will have a drag force who can actually make the satellite go slower and then the actually satellite will go down. Then you will have to, if you know in advance, you can actually push a little bit more fuel and then up the 
get a little bit of velocity and then going up, up a bit and to prevent this effect. So that's typically a uh, space weather effect. Okay, so now I'm going back to the solar irradiance in the UV and the upper planetary atmosphere. So here you have uh, what we call the cross section uh, according to the altitude. So it's typically you can that's for atmosphere for Earth, of course, but you can see the photoionization part here, so roughly below Lyman alpha, and then you actually uh, have the photodissociation of O2 and the photodissociation of O3. So when you have photodissociation, you can also have so you, you break O2, but then you also break O2, and this two uh, uh, oxygen atomic oxygen will actually go to a higher state of excitation. So so either you can actually make one in the ground, so actually with it's, it's this state O3P. But if you can also excite some uh, oxygen, atomic oxygen, and you can one go to one O one D or O one S, and of course these states are are willing to go back to the ground phase, uh, ground state because they don't like to be too much excited. So they will actually be deactivated just by emission. So you will get the red line if you go from O one oxygen one D to oxygen three P, and also if you go from O1S, you will go directly from the green, green line in that case, going through O and D, and then you will have the red line in that case. That, as we call the, the then you will get the typical atmospheric emission from the from any any type of planet, uh, planets or moons. The, uh, of course, you will have to, you need to have a molecular oxygen or atomic oxygen to get this in the first place. But also you can have water because the water can actually be photo dissociated. Then you will you will end up with with oxygen. You can also CO2, CO2. As soon as you have some atomic oxygen involved in the molecular, you, you might have some uh, atmospheric emission from those two uh, lines. So how do we do that? So it's very simple in theory. We just have to take into account the, a B along the low, which means that you will uh, try to assess the solar UV flux for each altitude within the atmosphere. So as soon as you have a bit of absorption, then you have to take into account this, take this absorption into account, then you just have to compute the solar UV flux for the altitude below, etc., etc. So for this, you need so the solar UV flux, or the stellar flux, if you are not interested to do solar, uh, planetary solar uh, system science. Then you will need absolutely to have the uh, cross-section so the, the probability interaction between the solar UV flux and uh, the, the molecule. And also you need to have a neutral atmosphere, of course. And that's it's actually a neutral atmosphere for, for Ganymede in that case. Um, and so now we'll present what we have done for, uh, for, seven, for 67P, so the comet that Rosetta has visited. And if you, you, you need to start with a model of neutral atmosphere, otherwise you cannot go very far. And for this, actually, we use, um, we use the, the, the data from the, the DFMS instrument, where, which was the Rosina instrument, which was on board Rosetta, that uh, Bira is a PI on it. And with this, we can actually have an estimation of the volatile element according to the water, of course. So the water is the most important one, and then we can actually have uh, a ratio for different type of molecules. So we have CO, CO2, and for the little story here, you also have very something in red because we find out that there is also molecular oxygen uh, within the atmosphere, the cometary atmosphere, which was quite surprising, which is still surprising somehow. But then we have to take into account because for this model, it's very important to to assess the, all the emission light, we, the atmospheric emission coming from O2 in that case. Okay, so if I do that, so Okay, now I'm just taking, um, try to assess how much is produced O1D and O1S in that case, and I have to compute the rate coefficient, so based on the BL and BLO, just for all the altitudes. And so, in first order, you can say that there is not that much absorption for a very low activity comet at 67P, but still, actually, you can lose roughly 10 to 12 percent for this uh, mon carbon monoxide, for the water, for example, you will lose 3%. The, the, so the rate will actually be uh, um, diminished by 3%. So it's not that much anyway. But still, you have to, if you want to get for, uh, to make a thorough analysis, you have to take this into account. And okay, so now it's uh, I only pr uh, talk about the production, and it's a little bit like for the solar atmosphere. You have uh, some part you have the production, but you also have to take into account the loss reaction. 
for the excited element. And exactly as for the solar atmosphere, you have to take it on the radiative decay. What we are looking at, what we are looking for, which is so the emission light, uh, green and the red light. And to have the collision reaction with the neutral species around. So here, it's not like electron for the solar atmosphere, but it's for the neutral um, around, around you. So you have just to take into account all this uh, equation. And then at the end, you found out that very far away from the, com from the, the nucleus, you will have mostly rare mostly uh, uh, relative decay as the main loss process, but very close to the nucleus, you are actually, especially for O1D, you will have uh, more, actually more uh, uh, deactivation by collision with water. And if you do that, actually you just have to solve this uh, continuity equation. We take into account, uh, we take the transport into account, especially for the, the red line, because the red line has a very long lifetime uh, expectancy of about 130 seconds. And then you will have, at the end, you will have the estimation of the number density of the red, uh, the O and D and O and S for, um, uh, within the atmosphere, uh, within the atmosphere, the, com the, the cometary atmosphere. And then from this, you can actually have an estimation of the, um, the emission. Uh, if you are looking here, so you are going to, you will put yourself between you and, uh, between uh, the comet and the sun. And you look and you're actually looking at the, the, all the emission coming from this, uh, this line. So you, you have to integrate over your line of sight. And in that case, so that's just number. So it's not the absolute number is not really interesting. But still, you can at least have uh, roughly 700 Rayleigh and 500 Rayleigh for the, the, the red and the green line, respectively. And what is very interesting here is not really the absolute value, since it's very difficult to, to get it for calibration pro problem, but it's more the, the ratio between those two. And because you can actually try to compare those ratio, which has been also determined by ground observation. So it's what I look at it here. You have uh, the ratio between the red, the green and the red line in that case. And so you have for two, uh, for two different type of cross-section model, model. So that's also something I don't want to talk, but there's also something very problematic. And here, you actually, you have uh, what the influence of the molecular oxygen presence within a, a cometary atmosphere because before we never take into account this because it, does, it has never been measured, it has also been never thought to have this because O2 is a very volatile element so as soon as you have a bit of energy the O2 will break so it was quite surprising to have O2 so so far we only, the model was only relying on the presence of water, CO2 and CO and you will get the uh, estimation of the green over red ratio in that case. But now, if, since you would have to take into account the O2, then very interesting because if you look only the if impact of CO2, if you increase uh, the abundance of CO2, this ratio green to over red will actually increase. And then the, and the O2 has exactly the opposite effect. So the green to red ratio will actually diminish. Just because actually the that, that's always related to the nature and actually to the characterization of the cross section for uh, the uh, for the production of the red of O and S O and D. So, so that's why we are really now to be careful when try to assess the the CO2 abundance is only based on this uh, G over R ratio because it's not true anymore. And also now. Doing a bit of space weather, planetary space weather, we can also take different type of uh, solar EUV flux. And, okay, so the green is very green, but, so if you just take a quiet sun, a non-flaring quiet sun, in that case, you will end up with this over, uh, this green over red ratio over there in black. If you take a still a non-flaring sun, but with a very high activity, this green over red ratio will actually increase a bit. And if you take a very powerful flare, Actually, this green over ratio will actually increase a lot. It just actually, again, the, the production of O1A states, so if you have an, an increase of this green over there, it's only because the oxygen state come only from spectral region below, lower than 150 nanometers. And if you are looking at the, the nature of the variability of the solar irradiance, more you go down in the wavelengths, more the variability will be higher. <coughs> But surprisingly, you also have, so you have, you have actually an 11 year cycle which has a clear impact over the two, but no sign of the 27 day solar modulation. And now you can also do the same for Halley, but 
for Ali because also he has been recently pro, uh, shown that they also have some O2, so we, have, we, need, we needed to make a, a new uh, estimation in that case. But then here it's a very interesting thing because for Halle the activity of the comet is that high that you cannot expect that the, the, the solar UV flux will actually not be, will be constant through the atmosphere of the comet. So we really need to take into account the, the absorption and that's why I was, I was just presenting before the 1D model of for 67P but not for Halle it's not possible. So you have to look, to look, to look for a, a, a 2D model in that case because otherwise here, if you look at 10 km above the nucleus, just uh, line of sight, 10 km just above the nucleus here, you can actually, you will uh, double overestimate your emission if you don't take into account the solar, abs uh, solar UV flux absorption. And which is, which is nice with this 2D modeling and you can actually drama and you can sense a map, emission map. So now I place myself in the quadrature phase, so you have the sun over there, you have the comet, and then I am looking in the, um, from the side, and then you can see that there is a nice asymmetry for the red and the green line emission just because of this uh, solar absorption in that case. So that could be actually some uh, very interesting information for concerning the, the neutral atmospheric model. And again, a bit for planetary uh, space weather, so it's exactly the same impact as for the 67P, so you will have an increase of the red emission and the green emission if you have a uh, more important uh, solar UV flux, of course. And the last thing I wanted to show is actually that if you are now taking, considering only taking a flare into account, for example, but now if you took, take a flare into account, but you are looking at two flares, which are uh, really, really, really similar in terms of power density, so X17 and X17.4, that's very, very big flare, so that's part, uh, that's uh, Correct me if I'm, wrong, if I'm wrong, but I think that's the, one of the most important measures. So, but now if we are looking at the, the location of the flare, so if you, if you look at if it's cometary or geo or moon effective, it depends where the flare is coming from, where you are looking at. So from our point of view, if you are looking at a flare which is actually coming from the center of the sun, and if you are looking at a flare which is actually coming from the limb, so, and that actually will have directly a different impact on the, the, the emission. So if you, if you come from the center, you have much more emission, meaning that you have much more energy coming through, uh, coming through the, the, solar, the, the upper atmosphere of the planet, moon, etc. And here, if you're coming from the lamp, you have less emission, so meaning less UV part. So it's just because actually the, just a, a geometry effect. So the, the solar energy will actually be absorbed directly from the solar atmosphere itself. So that's why you will have some kind of absorption effect. Okay, and just to, to uh, quickly conclude on that, okay, for, I was only talking about photo, photo uh, absorption and photo excitation effects, which is true for comets uh, because, and also for little moons, because it's true for comets because uh, photo absorption processes represent more than 99% of the solar, of the emission at the end. But now if you are going back for your Ganymede or Europa, this is cannot be true anymore. You have to take into account the, the impact of the electron precipitation in that case, which what we call more the aurora. And then if you do that for Europa, for example, you just have to have an idea about the density, density of the electron, also the temperature of the electrons, to have actually or the energy of the electrons to, to take into account this cross-section giving you one electron plus molecular oxygen will give, give you some uh, ox atomic oxygen in this particular state uh, and then this particular state which actually is, uh, is this one, one 5s in that case and this one 5s will actually emit some energy in the UV and 135.6 nanometers. And of course, if you can do that, you can also, based on the model, you can do that and you can also map of the rate coefficient, etc., etc. You can play a bit with this model and then you can try to find actually how much uh, emission line you will get from Europa for different specific line of sight. And uh, for the red line, for example, you can up to roughly 6,000 six, uh, 6, uh, Rayleigh, which is quite a lot. And also now in the UV, you can actually roughly Reach 1k, 1k Lorelei, which is also quite a lot. And I finish with this slide, which gives you some more uh, interesting lecture if you are interested in this topic. Thank you very much.